The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. The disciples told their story of what had happened on the road and how they had recognized Jesus at the breaking of bread. They were still talking about this when Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. In a state of alarm and fright, they thought they were seeing a ghost. But he said, Why are you so agitated and why are these doubts rising in your hearts? Look at my hands and feet. Yes, it is I indeed. Touch me and see for yourselves. A ghost has no flesh and bones, as you can see, I have. And as he said this, he showed them his hands and feet. Their joy was so great that they could not believe it, and they stood dumbfounded. So he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? And they offered him a piece of grilled fish, which he took and ate before their eyes. Then he told them, This is what I meant when I said, while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, in the prophets, and in the Psalms has to be fulfilled. He then opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, so you see how it is written that the Christ would suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that in his name, repentance for the forgiveness of sins would be preached to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses to this. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord, Lord Jesus Christ. Very good morning to you, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ. So once again, Happy Easter to everybody. Yes, it's the third Sunday of Easter and still we are celebrating the resurrection of the Lord. Now, the resurrection event was something that really shocked the apostles, shocked the disciples. And we can see that even after a few of the encounters with the risen Lord, they were still shocked whenever the risen Lord appeared to them. And that's what we saw in today's gospel. Still, they were thinking, this is a ghost. <laughs> they just couldn't believe it. And just imagine how hard it is perhaps even for us to believe it when we have not had the risen Lord appear to us. Okay? And this is this whole thing about eating the grilled fish and Jesus showing them my hands, my feet, to assure them, I'm not a ghost, I really am risen. Right? So they really couldn't believe it, even though they saw with their eyes. And they heard also from the other stories, and Jesus was even in their midst. Now sometimes that's how we are also. Even if Jesus is in our midst, somehow or rather, it's still like unbelievable. Still, we can't be without doubts, and still we struggle to believe. Yes, and that's exactly what the disciples were still experiencing. They had doubts rising in their hearts, right? Now, for us, my dear brothers and sisters, when do doubts start to rise in our hearts? What kind of doubts rise in our hearts with regards to our faith, with regards to our belief in God and all that? When do these doubts start to rise? There are many occasions, and it might be because we are going through something difficult in life. We feel as though we pray, our prayers are not answered. We feel as though one disaster after another is happening. Though I've been a good person my whole life, I came to Sunday Mass every week or so. I brought my children for catechism, don't know why everything is collapsing around me. Then we start to have doubts. Doubts start to rise in our hearts, but that's one possibility. Some others, they have doubts because uh, maybe... They're very intellectual people and they mix with a circle of people who plant doubts in their mind, saying that really, uh, Jesus Christ rose from the dead. 
Maybe they just imagine everything. Maybe it was a mass hallucination. So sometimes doubts are there because people have planted the doubts. Then we are thinking, hmm, yeah, I got no answer. How am I to prove to them? Of course, it's a trap. You can't prove to them. <laughs> Unless Jesus appears in front of them. Even then, they will still doubt. <laughs> Even if he eats the fish in front of them, still they'll doubt. Because it's their nature to doubt. And I should not say their nature. It is our human nature to doubt. Okay, so don't think that, you know, just because I'm a priest, I have no doubts. I have lots of doubts. But that does not mean that I have no faith. Because in, if everything was clear to me, why would I need to have faith? Okay, so even though we may have doubts, we, we, we may not have the answer to everybody's question. Somebody can come and say to you, prove to me God exists. Prove to me Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Prove to me this. Prove to me that God loves me. Prove to me. You can't prove. In the moment you can prove it, actually, we don't need any faith anymore. Okay, so this is a bit of a dilemma, isn't it? Kind of difficult. So, it's normal to be in this kind of a situation. So don't think that just because you may have some doubts, whatever the cause of the doubts, huh? maybe if, even from a lack of understanding, we might have doubts. But just because those doubts are present, do not think that God is not with you. Do not think that you have no faith. Okay? Now, so that's the first thing I wanted to just mention uh, alongside. And uh, it's not the main point, actually. In today's readings, the main point is actually about the forgiveness of sins, right? And we see that Christ tells them that in His name, they are to go and preach repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And that's what we have been hearing in the first reading the past few weeks. Peter especially going around and scolding everybody and saying, you all killed the Christ, He was the Messiah, you all butchered Him. Pilate wanted to let Him go, so still you all denounced Him and He ended up there. Repent, repent, repent. God will forgive your sins. That was what Peter was doing. He was fulfilling this command of Jesus. In his name, in the name of Jesus, go and preach the forgiveness of sins. And you, Peter, and all the apostles can do it because you have seen me resurrected. So the proof that Peter and the rest were speaking the truth was their personal testimony that they had encountered the risen Christ. The Christ whom the Jews had condemned and crucified, whom they said was a false prophet. But the apostles say, look, here is the proof. We saw with our own eyes, he is risen from the dead. And who has the power to do that? God. Now, will God raise the evil man, a false prophet, back to life? No. So that's the only kind of proof that we can have in answer to all kinds of doubts. And that is our own testimony. So, you know, many people come to faith, the Christian faith, they are converted. It's usually because of the testimony of somebody. You know, and that's why in many churches, they have a lot of activities where they give opportunity to their people to testify, this is how I experience God in my life. To testify, this is how I receive God's help. You know, and it helps somebody who maybe at that moment has not yet experienced the help of God. And so, is doubting. But by hearing the testimony of another, that, hey, God helped that person, and God helped that person. And that person says that, you know, this and that. So that witnessing, in fact, is the only proof that we can offer as Christians. Yeah? And it's not a kind of a empirical proof but it is a proof of experience and we have to trust the honesty of people. Now, talking about honesty, the testimony given by the apostles. Do you know why the gospel writers tell us so many details about how the apostles themselves doubted, they were surprised, they were shocked? It's to help us realize that they were not making it up. They were equally surprised. So that is supposed to help us to be more, how to say, have a, a better confidence lah, in the testimony that the apostles are giving. But you know what is the best assurance 
that the testimony the apostles have given us about the resurrection of Christ is, you know what is that? The fact that they were willing to die for their faith. They were willing to be persecuted, to be beaten up, and to be killed. To preach the message that Jesus was truly risen and that in Him we have the forgiveness of our sins. Now, if they were out to deceive us, if they were giving false testimony, why would they put their head on the chopping board? What would they gain from that? What would they receive from that? Nothing. So this is one of the strongest reasons why we believe the testimony of the apostles. Why we believe they didn't just make it up because they were willing to put their life in line to prove that in fact their testimony was trustworthy. Okay, that's the word I was looking for, so it didn't want to come to my mind. Trustworthy. The trustworthiness of the witness of the apostles is the fact that they were willing to lay down their life, to die for the message that they were preaching. And we saw the effort they took. The, they, they went to every possible length to preach the good news. They went everywhere, from one town to another, facing persecutions. They did everything they could to preach the message of Christ, to obey the command of Jesus, to go to all nations and to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So remember, dear brothers and sisters, if we are reasoning about this resurrection, if we want to feel a little bit more confident, it may not remove all our doubts, and that's normal, that's okay. But at least because of the trustworthy testimony of the apostles, let us believe. Okay? So anyway, if anybody asks you, why do you believe in the resurrection of Jesus? Don't say, because it's written in the Bible. Okay, you can say that. It's not the best answer. Because then they'll ask you, well, how do you know the Bible is true? Next question, now, follow-up question. Okay? Anyway, if you, even if you answer along that lines, don't forget, tell them, because people have died for this truth. Who are these people? The apostles and even those other disciples. They were willing to die to proclaim that Jesus was truly risen. Now, if it is something false, if they were to gain something from this so-called lie, I do not know what it is. Lah. There is nothing. They lost everything, in fact. You know, they were not trying to give us a false testimony so that they could sell some product to us, so that they could get some profit from something. They lost everything. So it's either they are telling us the truth or they are really fools. Yeah, either one of it. Lah. Okay. So this is one good answer you can give for anybody who asks you, why you believe in the resurrection? I believe because the apostles were willing to die to preach the risen Christ to the nations. They were willing to die for the message that they were preaching, the good news. And that's also why I feel I can trust enough to put my faith in this religion that teaches me that God so loved the world, He sent His only begotten Son into the world to die for us. And He died on the cross, and through that death, He offered a sacrifice for the forgiveness of our sins. And in Jesus, our advocate before the Father, we all have the opportunity to be forgiven our sins and to be reconciled with God, enter into a life not only of uh, rec not only a life of uh, friendship with God, but greater, closer intimacy with God. That is the message the apostles were preaching, and this is the message that we believe in at the very core. Okay, so now Sunday school teachers, I don't know they're here or not. At the end of all the years of catechism, this is the core of the faith that our children need to know. If they didn't understand this, then we have wasted our time with them. They may know seven sacraments, ten commandments. First one is what? Second one is what? Third one is what? The tenth is what? They may know which are the holy days of obligation. They may know how to say Hail Mary, Our Father, all the prayers. They will know all the devotions. 
They may know even all the Bible stories, whatever it is. But if they don't understand this core of our Christian faith, which is the resurrection of Jesus, His passion, death and resurrection, the purpose and what it signifies, then actually they have wasted their years of Sunday school education if they don't understand this core. Because it is this core that gives meaning to everything else. Yeah, the centrality of the, what we call the Paschal mystery. Have you all heard of this term? Paschal mystery. So now when you hear this term Paschal mystery, you will hear it a lot in the press. You know what it's talking about. This core of our Christian faith, the passion, death and resurrection of Christ. And what does this passion, death and resurrection of Christ signify? I'm repeating so that you will catch the core. That God is love and God has sent His only Son into the world as a light into the world and this only Son has died for us on the cross so that we sinners can be forgiven our sins, receive the mercy of God and be reconciled with God and so that we human beings can rediscover our dignity as children of God and enter into deeper friendship with God. Okay, and this entering into deeper friendship with God is what everything else is about, is what we live in our day-to-day -day life and the reason why we come to church also, to deepen our relationship with God. And yes, my dear brothers and sisters, there are many people in the world who not only believe that there is no God, and even if they do believe there is a God, they do not know they can enter into an intimate relationship with God. That's something they are missing out on. Because maybe in their minds, religion is only about some kind of cult, some kind of uh, rites and rituals, some kind of morality. And they say, I don't need religion for morality. I can learn pendidikan moral in school. So then we know they have not understood what is the core of the faith. Now sadly, some of our Catholics also may slowly be influenced and have that same kind of mindset. Then you know, all the years of catechism was wasted. They didn't get the core. They got all the externals only. And therefore, they reduced their Christian faith just to morality. But our Christian faith is much more than that. Okay? Now, hmm, sorry, it's getting a bit too long already. The problem is that our Christian faith is very complicated. <laughs> so it's hard to explain everything in 10 minutes or 15 minutes, you know. Okay, but anyway, I think enough. Enough for today, Eddie. You caught the word Paschal Mystery, yes? Yes or not? Alright, huh? so it refers to passion, death, resurrection of Christ, but in reference to that whole core that I spoke to you just now. Right? Okay, enough for today. Learn that. And because it's the most important thing. If not, you can just go on and on and on because it links here, links there, links everywhere, links all over the place. <laughs> okay? So remember this core. And at the very core of this core is the resurrection of Jesus. Okay? Now, one last thing, just for you all to reflect upon, is the perfection of God's love. This is something you see in the second reading that was telling us to obey God's commandments, obey the commandments of Jesus. Yeah? And the purpose is so that the love of God can become perfected in you. Now, that is something that we should meditate upon. By being a Christian, Am I becoming a more loving person? Am I radiating the love of Jesus to others? Uh, that is the purpose that we are here in this world. That's how we preach the good news also. That's how we bring the light of God into the world. And that is how we bring peace and joy of the risen Lord into the world. The more we as each person here becomes a sacrament of God's love. That's our mission. Okay? And maybe some other time we'll talk about that in a more elaborate manner. So just leave this thought with you. The core, the resurrection, and remember your mission to be the sacrament of God's love.